I was intending to upload a slideshow of old photographs of Liverpool Cathedral's construction as an annex to LHFE End. But after seeing so many of the warm and wonderful responses in the comments section, I thought I'd add some commentary to address some of the questions and queries. The first thing to note is that on the internet, when doing a Google or DuckDuck image search, you won't find endless historical construction photographs. But if you start looking in archives, then you'll find a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of which I'll be covering in LLG. And this is where I've learned that books like this are very helpful. There are a lot of archive photographs and documents that are not accessible in free, digitalized form on the internet, but have been published in books. A lot of the comments I received have insisted that Liverpool Cathedral is a rebuild or renovation of a previous structure. This is the oldest surviving photograph of the site where the cathedral stands today. It was taken around 1901. You can see the neoclassical edifice here, and we don't see the cathedral. This is a photo of early excavation work in 1904. The timber's been used to construct a supporting amphitheatre, and if you look closely, you can see on the steam-powered cranes one of the building contractors, Morrison & Sons, Wavertree. The first area of the cathedral to be built was its Lady Chapel. Here are the foundations for that. What's important to note is the chapel is just one small portion of the overall structure. Here is a progress shot. If you look closely, you can see the layers of brickwork forming here. Next came the chancel. Here is the beginning work on the chancel. Again, another portion of the cathedral. All the while, the Lady Chapel is coming along nicely. The Lady Chapel and Chancel were actually the first parts of the cathedral to open to the public. And why did it open when the rest was not completed? Because there was a requirement to meet the demands of a growing and pious population. The First World War halted progress, but it resumed in the 20s. This is a photograph taken in 1924, showing the completed chancel. Then came the central space. Here is one of them making good progress on the central space. And another. There exists no evidence of this being a rebuild or renovation. The cathedral construction began in 1904 and ended in 1978. That's 44 years ago. It's the largest cathedral in England. This illustration is Gilbert Scott's initial design, which changed multiple times. It was a competition submission. Architecture competitions are common practice. Just see the submissions in 2019 to replace Notre Dame's spire. And it's commonplace for the initial working designs to change and be refined due to many influencing factors, such as scope, finances, and so on. The cathedral's construction is not the mystery here. The mystery of this site is the old water tunnels that were constructed during the Enlightenment and the spring which still runs today. This site replaced an old medieval water system and infrastructure. I've also seen a lot of comments insisting that we cannot build these structures, that it's a lie. And at one point, I also thought that. Construction started in 1904 and finished in 1978. Before World War II, the means of construction was primarily industrial revolution technology. Steam-powered cranes, steam-powered saws, etc. This is a photograph and footage of the steam-driven frame saws, which worked every day cutting large blocks of stone procured from the quarry. After World War II, there was more modern technology, such as pneumatic drills. The wars slowed the progress of this structure significantly. If it wasn't for the wars, I'd venture that they may have got it done in around 45 years. The interior of the cathedral walls are made from thousands and thousands of red brick.
The exterior is sandstone clad in, or a facade, and you can find an abundance of photographic evidence testifying to this. Red brick is beautiful, but really bricks in general are nothing special. They're efficient, easy to produce en masse, and have been produced en masse since antiquity. They certainly could do it in both the 19th and 20th centuries. Here is an image of a 19th century underground reservoir. If you go to the site and walk around, you'll start noticing a lot of loose bricks. And if you examine them closely, you'll see red bricks with Victorian company names on them. The brick is not lying. There is a difference between old red brick and 19th century Victorian red brick. And now you might say, aha, so Liverpool is not a real cathedral if the majority of the wall's interior are composed of red brick. But that's not correct. If you look at many medieval cathedrals, you'll realise that the walls are composed of a type of rubble interior and then a carved stone clad in exterior finish. Again, there is nothing impossible or particularly special about this. What we see here with the red brick is nothing more than a modern upgrade to this medieval technique. The red brick also explains this photograph. A few in the comments have referred to this image as proof of a rebuild or that the powers that be are lying about this structure. But if you look closely, you can see that the photograph here shows a red brick wall. The same red brick we see here. And here. And here. And here. And why? Like I said earlier, the cathedral actually opened much earlier, starting with the completed chancel. This is a long time before the structure was completed in its entirety. In 1938, when this photo was taken, they were expanding westward to here. This red brick wall here is a temporary wall. Brick walls are easy to build. Ultimately, brick is Lego, and the public was still using this area of the cathedral. They are digging here to lay the foundations for the westernmost end of the nave. As you see here in the aerial shot from 1965, this end was still not complete and continually undergoing extension. Temporary brick walls allowed the population to attend services simultaneously. Here is a close-up of this area as it progressed in 1969. Look, another temporary brick wall. And if you still don't believe me, then compare this area with a photo I took myself. This decoration is the same. This border was not added yet. This tracery is the same. And these statues here are being sheltered by the timber boxes here. But as you can see, the stained glass up here is finished. Look, here is an image of them designing the glass. Is this basic red brick wall really evidence of a previous impossible structure that they are renovating and replacing? Here is an image after the temporary wall was dismantled and the arch in place. A service is taking place despite the arch frame still being in place. As you can see, they used a cathedral while they were still constructing it. And I know that you'll say the structure looks weathered and older in this photo, but you have to remember that this section is not complete. There is no roof above. The rain, the sunlight, the camera all affect how the stone and brick look in a photograph. We see that here. 
Variations in tone and highlights are not proof of genuine weathering, especially in old photographs. Another trend in response is that Liverpool Cathedral was post-industrial revolution. What about the ones that came before? What about the structures that took three to four years? And this is where it gets complex, and it's one of the central themes of LLG. In terms of genuine medieval cathedrals, Hereford Cathedral was completed over 171 years, York Minster 242 years, Gloucester 410 years, Salisbury 100 years, Wells 274 years, Exeter 288 years, Litchfield Cathedral 145 years. But in terms of a lot of the structures that went up during the 18th century and after, and at such pace, this is where it gets complicated. Can you tell the difference between a structure like this, and one like this? I never used to be able to, and I still struggle. Both are in the Gothic style. Both are parish churches. But Ludlow is genuine. This is what the interior looks like. And Belper... Well, have a look. You see, no real arches or columns. It looks like a grand church on the outside, but in essence it's a facaded box. There is real stone masonry, and then there is pseudo stone masonry, or free masonry. Elpa took one year to build in 1824, and it's actually no great secret or conspiracy. They actually tell us that artificial stone was used widely during the 18th and 19th centuries. Usually poured from a mix and molded. Code stone is not real stone, yet it's just as hard as stone, almost impossible to differentiate from real stone, and is present in abundance in a city like London. One of Wyatt's contributions to crew was this pair of sphinxes, and they were very fashionable. They're made out of code stone, which became hugely popular amongst landowners at the end of the 18th century. And the whole point about code stone is it's not stone at all. It's clay mixed in with various ingredients to make it exceptionally durable. So this hasn't been carved, it's been modelled, been cast. The original workshop ceased production in 1837. Hello. And it took years of trial and error for the sculptor Stephen Pettifer. Okay, I'm Steve. Steve. Pettifer. Very nice, nice to meet you. you. To uncover the secret of the code formula and technique. This is a bracket um, off a building in London. Which building? Buckingham Palace. Right. Is there a lot of code at Buckingham Palace? A huge amount. Code sculpture was made using moulds, which is both much faster than carving a block of stone and also meant that the mould could be reused many times. However, the main advantage of code over carved stone lay in the extreme fine detail and the quality of craftsmanship that could be applied to the clay. Yeah, actually, in clay, we can, we can really push the detail and the undercuts and yeah. be re really extravagant with it. Whereas in stone, it's harder. So presumably, say, take this here. This keystone. Yeah, that would be really difficult. If, if you look at the, de the detail in here, it would be very tricky in stone, wouldn't it? Exactly. Yeah. You wouldn't do that in lim limestone. Stephen explained to me some of the secrets of this extraordinary versatile and durable material. This is um, the clay. We have lots of different blends. Okay. Is this a secret, by the way? Are we allowed to do, do you want to give away the blend? I'm, I'm, or... I'm, I'm not that secretive about it. Because ultimately, yeah. it's, the, it's, the, it's the sculpting that's... Right. That, that's, that's difficult, that makes it hard to produce. So let me have a look at that. So I can see the little bits in it, the little white bits. And what you're looking at there is this, which is called grog. 
code is a mixture of fired up ceramic grit, powdered glass, sand, and ground flint. But then you treat it like clay. Yes. You model it like clay, you fire it like clay, yeah. and, and it goes through. But it will weather and last much better than normal terracotta. And yes. sunstone. Oh, lot, yeah, I mean, lasts a lot longer than any limestones. Right. And marble. Really? Yeah, longer than marble? Yeah. See, to a layperson... A lot that, longer. That is an incredible it's fact. It's an incredibly hard material. Scagliola is not real marble, but moulded and sets as hard as marble. There are many artificial stones such as Victoria stone, Portland cement, stucco that went into the creation of a vast amount of classical and gothic revival pieces that were completed in the 19th century, produced en masse with moulds. There is a difference between real, purist masonry and pseudo masonry. These structures are not all equal and they openly admit that they cut many corners. And why not? If you're producing en masse, you need the cheap and the efficient. There is nothing impossible about this classical stuff. And I didn't realize that until I started getting out and looking at it closer. And I'm not trying to discredit pseudo masonry. Molding like this is a talent in itself, but it's not the real thing. But it does raise an important discussion as to how easy it is to edit and change structures with these techniques. I received a good comment on this, saying that stone carving is a hoax, so throw us off the mark, it's all poured concrete. But I do not agree, Great Pyramid K is good, and everyone should watch it, but it's deeply flawed and more of the same reductive revisionism that doesn't hold up to scrutiny, and the ending is very questionable. This is all a big theme of LLG, I do not subscribe to the maximal approach, not everything is poured, just as not all geology is a melted building. Stone masonry is not a hoax, and we have masons alive today that live and breathe this. We also have a lot of very old quarries. Quarries are not concrete factories. The megalithic seems an impossibility, yes, but the cathedrals are very possible. I'm not disputing pouring as a reality, but they tell us that with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, brick making and cement disappeared only to resurface again right at the end of the Middle Ages, as the Renaissance began. Who or what rose again? Rome did, masters of cement. The central theme of LLG is my research into trying to decipher what's real and what's not, how they have appropriated medieval architecture and use pseudo masonry to potentially alter the historical narrative. As the photographs and footage of Liverpool Cathedral show, the stone cladding was carved and shaped by masons. The marks on these sandstone blocks are the marks of Mason's tools, probably greatly aided by post-World War II technology. You can see the length of the strokes and their inconsistency. The lines do not run in a uniform manner, and this demonstrates that they were not finished by huge machines. And we see the same thing here. and here. 
This rock was quarried from Walton Quarry. If you look, you'll see it's the same red pigmented sandstone. This was cut with steam powered machines and hand tools, but this only speeds up the process. The medieval masons built their sites right next to local quarries to be more efficient. Here in Fountains Abbey, you can see part of the long quarried wall here, and it runs all along this site. Lincoln Cathedral's quarry is one mile away, and they still use it today to renovate and replace the aging stone of the cathedral, using traditional masonry techniques. If you go to quarries or watch masons work, you'll realise that stone masonry is indeed very possible. It's not a hoax, and the skills passed down the generations prove this. All post-industrial technology has done is reduce the time frame it takes to complete a structure. These medieval structures took hundreds of years to complete, and much like Liverpool Cathedral, they probably were used in sections of the structure before the entire thing was finished. Now whether the time frame for medieval construction is a lie, and the Industrial Revolution actually occurred much earlier in our timeline, is one of the questions I will be investigating in my new series, and asking whether the cathedral's use was primarily for worship, or perhaps something else. But there is a lot of complexity that needs to be presented first. Each structure is different and requires its own in-depth research that, as I have come to learn, needs attention beyond Wikipedia. And it's mind-boggling to contemplate what those of the past achieved. And the most tragic thing about this whole investigation is that it throws into sharp contrast just how much we've regressed as a society and cannot recognise human talent anymore and ascribe it to something else. There were advanced civilizations in history, but there was no great reset in the 19th century. Our ancestors were the advanced ones, and our culture demonstrates this. Culture is not limited to architectural expression. Compare the literature of the 1800s with our writing today. Listen to Beethoven. And then our music today. Waved off from got skunk in my suit in a rage of hitting with your mom. Yeah. Taste the traditional cuisine of the past and compare with today. The way we painted back then. And now the art we produce today. The big lie surrounding the cathedrals is not the impossibility of their construction. The lie is something else, and it's a lot more complicated, worrying, and mind-boggling than I first realized. I got it wrong, and now I'm going to correct it with a new series. But I will not continue to discredit or erase my ancestors when there is a wealth of evidence and information working against me. I cannot do it, especially just to appease a thirst for conspiracy. Like I said, there are big lies, and there was a great reset. It just didn't happen in the 19th century. And the impossibility of the architecture is not the issue. We can build like this, and we can definitely pour cement and mould code. I hope that adds some clarity, sets a tone for what to expect, and hopefully I can get the next episode finished soon. Until then.